welcome to the, the webinar uh, Navigating Complexities and Customer Demands in the European Turmeric Market. We'll uh, wait a, a minute or so to, so that more attendees uh, can enter this webinar and then we'll, uh, we'll start. You can already read uh, some of the messages I have here on screen. Maybe this is already a good time to tell you these messages. Uh -huh. So please uh, notice that we cannot hear or see you. You have the possibility to ask uh, questions using the questions tab in the menu on the right of your screen. Uh, we will try to answer most of your questions. Uh, if it's too many and we get out of time, we will uh, make a selection of the questions. Uh, there will be a recording of the session available after the webinar. It will be emailed to you when you have, uh, to your uh, address of registration. And we ask you at the end to complete a short uh, survey uh, how, uh, for the ev evaluation of this webinar. So if you have audio problems, you can try a phone call uh, or try login again. So uh, to everyone who just uh, entered this webinar, welcome to uh, the session uh, Navigating uh, Complexities and Customer Demands in the European Turmeric Market. Uh, today, I will first introduce uh, the speakers. Um, uh, yeah, I myself will start with a short introduction on CBI, but the main speakers for today uh, are uh, from uh, Globally Cool, which is Luz Maria Barrientos, who is an international trade consultant at Globally Cool. And she will start up the presentation with uh, how the market looks like. And then we have Paul Wiertsema, who is a uh, consultant and expert in the spice uh, sourcing industry yeah, at his uh, company Spice and Advice. So he will do part of the presentation. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Raymond Lantes, who is a purchasing manager at uh, uh, Uroma, uh, which is a Dutch uh, buyer of, uh, of spices and producer of spices. So we're very welcome, Raymond. Always nice to have a, um, to have a purchaser in, in our midst who can tell the experience with uh, trading and buying spices from uh, countries uh, abroad. Uh, so uh, this is the agenda for today, and um, I will start with a short introduction on uh, on, on CVI, and then uh, Louis will uh, get on with the European turmeric market, and uh, also then uh, the fourth critical success factors will be discussed, and uh, Raymond will tell about uh, Uroma sourcing strategy for turmeric in specific. We'll end with the questions and answer. So I'll tell you again at the right of your screen, you have the possibility to answer, to, uh, to type questions. And please do that. You can do that uh, during all webinar and we will, uh, we will discuss them at the end of the webinar in the Q and A section. Uh, so we are CBI, the center for the promotion of imports from developing countries. Uh, our mission is to support the transition towards inclusive and sustainable economies, and we strengthen the social, economic, and environmental sustainability of small and medium enterprises in developing countries, mostly by connecting them to European and regional markets. So uh, with our work, we contribute to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, which shows here, number eight, decent work and economic growth, number five, uh, gender equality, Number 12, responsible consumption and production, and uh, number 17, partners for the goals. Uh, at this moment, uh, CBI uh, can start new projects and is active with uh, export coaching programs uh, in these countries, mostly in Africa and some in uh, Asia and Middle East. We are uh, active in uh, 13 sectors at the moment. And as you see, uh, uh, herbs and spices is one of those uh, sectors which will be uh, central today. There are two main pillars at CBI. These are the CBI projects. The, those are the uh, four-year 
four to five year expert coaching programs. Um, and we help small, medium enterprises and business support organizations to enter uh, in the European markets with their products. We focus on sustainable production and exports as a means to create decent jobs. Uh, we always try uh, to make, uh, you know, yeah, make use of local knowledge. And as I told you before, it's a four-year expert coaching program with, with different stages, such uh, training on certifications, but also going to European fairs and uh, uh, exp uh, so show your products. So these are two uh, projects in the spices on the right. We have now Spices Ethiopia and Jinja uh, Nigeria. This is the running project in the spices uh, sector. Second next uh, important uh, pillar of CVI is the market information. Uh, we make market information available for all, uh, all, all small and medium enterprises in developing countries. Uh, the study should help you to uh, realize your export ambitions. Uh, they're easy to access on our website. And uh, the studies answer questions such as which countries offer the most opportunities, uh, which channels should you use to enter the market in your sector, and what laws and requirements must you follow. Uh, please visit our uh, website, cbi.eu slash market information, and you can go to the, to the page for the uh, spices and herbs. And this is uh, like a, a screen, uh, shot of the, of the page you see we have the sector studies and we have lots of product studies on black pepper on cardamom on, uh, on turmeric of course curcuma and other spices so please visit our website and uh, now we'll go to uh, Luz for the main presentation i will uh, make her presenter All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, one minute, I'm trying to share my screen. Yes. There you go. Is it working? Mm. Yes, now I see your screen. Great. Very good. Well, good uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Thomas, for the introduction. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for, for joining uh, this webinar. Um, as Thomas was saying, my name is Luz Barrientos. I am part of the Globally to Cool team. And this year, together with Paul, we've been creating really interesting and insightful uh, studies for the whole spices sector, so I can only invite you to take a look at the CBI website and check those reports because they really contain a lot of uh, great uh, information for you. And actually this webinar is based also partly on the update that we did on the studies for curcuma. So um, let's start with uh, an overview of how the European market is looking like uh, for turmeric. So, um, one second, it takes a few minutes to reflect. There you go. So uh, we can start by saying that turmeric is definitely one of the most imported uh, spices uh, in the European market. As we can see here in the, in the table, is the fourth most imported uh, spices by, by volume with uh, 20,000 tons in 2022 but actually if we take a deeper look we will see that ginger actually i mean these statistics include also fresh ginger uh, so the actual statistics let's say for dry ginger will be a bit lower which would mean that turmeric it's even bigger it might be even the third uh, one dried after chilies and pepper um, and it, it is true that turmeric is very present in a lot of uh, spice mixes that are currently being used in the industry. It's widely used uh, to color foods. Um, it's a natural uh, colorant, let's say. So it's quite, quite present. And you can see that it's even uh, more, has more volumes than cinnamon, which is quite a traditional spice in the European market. So we have a very interesting uh, level um, in terms of volume here. But if we take a look, a closer look at how the imports 
behave in the last five years, we will see that we have two, let's say, main disruptors uh, in this, in this, in the trade of this spice. On the one hand, we have uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which impacted the imports because during the pandemic, uh, products that had uh, like health benefits that helped improve the immune system really became very popular and grew their imports. And this is the case as well for turmeric. During the pandemic, it became quite, quite popular. And we saw an increase of products containing turmeric. But also at the same time, we had the Brexit because in 2020, at the end of 2020, we have the end of the um, transition period. So we will see in the following slide that the UK used to be the main importer, but after the end of this transition period, uh, their imports decrease. And that truly affects um, the statistics here. It truly affected the imports of a whole uh, block. And that's why we see a decline in the following years. But let's take a look uh, at the next slide to see it in more detail. We have now that in 2022, Germany is now uh, the biggest importer. And if we take a look at the statistic of Germany, it looks pretty much like other products that were positively affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The imports were already growing from 2018 to 19, and they grew also in 2020, although we had a lot of issues in the supply chains, although it was difficult to import, especially during the first half of the year. And in 2022, we even have a peak. Why is that? Because a lot of people were a little, or a lot of traders didn't know what to expect based on what happened in the year before. They didn't know if there are gonna be other issues with the supply chain. Will they be able to continue importing? Will there be any other issues? So they increased their stocks. So in 2021, for several products, you will see a peak followed by a decrease of the imports. And that's because there were some stocks that were left from the peak of 2021. So the year after you see a decrease. But when we ask the importers, what is the reason? Why are the imports decreasing? They were not saying that there was an issue with the demand. They are saying, well, the years before, everything was a little crazy because of the pandemics. So we are just coming back to, let's say, to normal. And this is what we can see here in Germany. When we take a look at the UK, it looks quite different, right? Because we see they were the first one in 2018 and 19. They have a peak in 2020, which also matches with the end of this um, transition period for the Brexit. And after the transition period ends, we, we see a sharp decline to 11,000 tons and then even to 9,000 tons. And if we take a look at the Netherlands, they are increasing, increasing, increasing over the years, and they were able to maintain in 2022, even though they also probably have high stocks. And that is because most probably the Netherlands is catching some of the, the business that are being, let's say, that are not being done by the UK anymore. They're taking this place as a spice trader in Europe and re-exporting to other countries. Um, in Europe. So all in all, even though we have like these fluctuations in the imports, we have to say that the turmeric, the demand is quite stable. Turmeric is here to stay and we have different demand drivers that are like the reason uh, for this steady demand. And on the one hand, we have uh, the fact that the consumers in Europe are becoming more health conscious. So on the one hand, it has an impact because um, companies in the food industry are trying to clean their labels, let's say, to go or stay away from, let's say, chemical colorings. 
and try to change them by natural colorings or by products that look good on their labels. And turmeric looks pretty good on labels uh, because it's perceived as a rather a healthy ingredient. So there is one reason that is, or one driver of this demand. But on the other hand, as we were saying before, before during the pandemic, turmeric truly became uh, quite popular um, because uh, it is supposed to have a great health benefits to boost the immune system. So um, consumers kept this image in mind, let's say, um, and the industry is answering. So we have now new developments or new products that contain curcuma. Here uh, on the right, for example, we have this curcuma chai, which is from a brand called Yogi Tea. It's a tea brand from Germany and they have, um, you know, as the name says, they are very focused on this uh, yoga, well-being trend. They have uh, products inspired in Ayurveda, which is this Indian like medicinal and plant tradition. So they have products uh, that are, you know, in that direction and they do use a lot of curcuma in their recipes. Uh, we have, for example, here on the other on the other side, Actimel, which is it's a little bit the opposite of Yogi Tea because this is a very niche product. While Actimel from the company Danone, you know, this is like a global player, um, and they have this Actimel, which is supposed to uh, boost your immune system uh, with some bacteria, if I'm not mistaken. But now they also have a, a new version that contains turmeric and mango. So we see, I mean, we, when we have a big player like Danone with a, one of these brands that, are, that is present worldwide, uh, making a launch um, like this, this means this is becoming really mainstream and there is a, an interesting demand uh, of uh, turmeric from the consumer. And in the middle, we have um, new products, completely new products that appeared uh, recently, uh, I would say also related to the pandemic, which is like this um, shot that contains ginger and contains curcuma, and people are taking them like as a way to support their immune system. And this trend of health consciousness also offers opportunities for organic certified products because some of these companies, especially more smaller or niche companies like this Yogi Tea, for example, they're using organic products or organic uh, ingredients. And then we have another driver, which is the fact that Asian food is becoming really, really popular. I would say it's becoming mainstream. Um, we have a lot of Asian restaurants uh, from, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years in Europe, but now it's not a matter of restaurants anymore. We have that the food industry is really betting on Asian flavors. For example, um, I wanna show you this igloo fish. Igloo is uh, a really traditional German brand of frozen foods, quite traditional. It's really old in the market and they uh, started with typical, uh, let's say German uh, recipes, but now they have broadened their assortment and they have included a lot of flavors and a lot of uh, products with, um, you know, Asian flavors and inspired in Asian cuisine. For example, this red curry fish, and here you can see it has a paprika, it has um, broccoli and it has the turmeric. So this is quite a demand driver because these companies Imp or they use uh, good volumes of, of the product. And here on the right, I, we have another quite interesting example because this is a pre-cooked rice from a private label. And you know, when a private label launches something is because it has a lot of, uh, like it sells very good. Um, so you see now this quite basic product, which is pre-cooked rice, but with curry flavor now, and it contains curcuma. So this is really, it also shows how mainstream Asian food has become. And that is of course, very relevant in terms of, of volumes, right? And here in the middle, is just an example of a, a recipe from a quite established food magazine in the UK. So we see that the turmeric is not only, is not only being used as a spice for Asian cuisine, but also it is being more integrated into other new recipes. So 
as we can see now, we have a good demand of turmeric. We have also the fact that um, the trade inside the European Union is re or inside Europe is kind of reorganizing after Brexit. So there are opportunities there for new companies or for companies in the trade of turmeric. But at the same time, we have the fact that the regulations uh, are becoming more and more complex. Uh, the customers um, are increasing their demands and they have a very uh, diversified assortment <laughs> of demands. So that definitely becomes an issue. It's not that easy um, to participate in this market. So what we would like to do here is to share with you some ideas on what are these regulations and how US companies can, can tackle them and can really enter the market and take advantage of these new opportunities. So now I would like uh, to give Paul the floor. He's going to continue with the what we have identified as the four critical success factors to be able to enter the turmeric market and really take advantage of these opportunities. Thank you. Um, before Paul starts, I would like to remind the audience that they have the possibility to answer to, to ask questions uh, on the, in the menu right in the questions tab. So please answer your questions in the menu. Uh, okay, Paul, go ahead. Okay, Luz, thank you very much for your introduction of the European market for turmeric. And I like to continue with uh, what, in my opinion, are the four critical success factors to enter the European uh, turmeric market. Uh, Luz, next slide, please. And in my opinion, these four factors are quality, which we can divide in mandatory legal requirements and which are uh, additional customer requirements, price. It's all about conditions and markets compliance, supply about reliability and flexibility and differentiation. What makes your turmeric special? So next slide, please. When we look at the quality aspects, the legal aspects are, are very important. And the European Food and Safety Authority, the EFSA, is making these rules. And I can tell you the European food legislation is quite strict, probably one of the most strict in, uh, ones in the world. And it's very important to comply with that. And also the EFSA is controlling this by the, uh, by, uh, how do you call it? by the local food authorities in each country. And they want to have you in place some supply chain transparency and also some controls in the supply chain. So the minimum you should have is the hazard analysis of critical control points in place. In my opinion, for turmeric, the focus should be in particularly on suppliers to the European Union about the residues of agrochemicals. So what are the maximum residues levels Almost for every pesticide or fungicide, there is a maximum residue level in the EU, and these are very low. You talk about PPBs, so it's very important that you comply with this. Microbiological contaminants, salmonella is uh, also an, an issue, which is in, uh, a legal requirement. Uh, mycotoxins, aflatoxin and ochratoxin levels, we also talk about PPBs. And this is uh, also a carcinogenic uh, product. So these, it's very important to control this uh, authenticity, additive declaration, uh, composition. When you have allergens involved, in particular peanuts, it's a very critical, but it can be also some other spices like celery or whatever, which, which can cause contaminations, which is a big problem in the European market. And of course, food approved packaging is an, is an uh, important issue, uh, also stated by law. And I can tell you also the uh, regulation concerning Mosmoa, the oil residues, which sometimes come uh, from packaging, but which can also come from uh, contamination in the production process, will be more strictly controlled from the 1st of January next year. Labeling is, of course, also very important according to the European legislation. So next slide, please. 
besides the legal uh, requirements, we have the additional customer requirements. First of all, the customer will, the European customer will look at your approval system. How do you control the food safety? And do you have a food safety and quality system in place like IFS, IFS, the International Food Standard, or FSSC, or BRC, or any other certified certification controlling the food quality according to the legal aspects, but also according to the additional customer requirements. This is very important. And besides that, they may, might ask for an additional questions about CSR, corporate social responsibility. They might ask additional questions about an organic certificate, if relevant, and things like that. This is to get to become approved as a supplier. And then the next step is to get your product approved. Often European buyers will have a technical data sheet or product specification in place in which they explain exactly what is for their application relevant and what's important for their uh, for this uh, application. The sensory aspects, physical aspects, chemical aspects, moisture content, and in particular concerning uh, turmeric, the curcumin content is often quite important. Microbiological uh, issues, is it the total plate count, does it have to be heat treated? Often uh, is that expressed in the maximum total plate count and some other issues about packaging, shelf life, uh, non-GMO is also something which is very often mentioned in these technical data sheets. So next slide, please. So what are the main <coughs> risks in turmeric according to my experience and what are my recommendations? So the major non-compliance risks in turmeric are residues of agrochemicals. Please note exceeding the MRLs can sometimes uh, happen very easy and it is really recommended when you uh, grow turmeric or when you talk to your farmers that they don't use any pesticides. This can be a problem concerning the maximum residue levels in the European market. Because in many countries of origin, some uh, of pesticides can be used or are still legal, which are already forbidden in Europe because they are a major risk to exceed the maximum residue levels. Other contaminants, afla and ochratoxin, in total maximum 15 ppb, is a big risk. And it has mainly to do with post-harvest practices. Please select the product good before you start grinding. So avoid molded product of right and select the product carefully. So this reduces the risk very much. And uh, authenticity, illegal dyes, illegal colorants are also a big issue and have been a big issue in the past in India. So products should be still tested on that. As also, for instance, Sudan 1 is considered a carcinogenic product. So this is something the European food authorities will be very critical on when they find it in your product. And every country has at every port in Europe, they will have local food authorities testing the containers. And I can tell you that grinded spices in particular are considered a high risk product. And the food authorities might control one out of two containers or one out of three containers, but the possibility that your container is checked is quite large. So, and once they find something which is not according to the legal requirements, your product will be reported in the RASF system, the European Rapid Alert System for Food and Feed. And once you are in there, you will have a major problem because all the details about the product, about the country of origin, about the supplier is stated in the system. And uh, you don't want to be in there because that's not good for your image and not good for the product. So what's my advice concerning the approval process? Pre-shipment sampling and testing of a, of, a, of a batch is very important. And a batch is often in this in turmeric you talk often about a full container load and make sure that this best batch is tested by a mutually agreed accredited laboratory and mutually agreed together with your customer in Europe. 
ask your customer, what do you want on your certificate of analysis to prove that this container is compliant with as well the legal as the additional customer requirements. Quite important. And whenever you have some doubt about sensory aspects, I always tell people, uh, customers, uh, uh, suppliers to send the sample to the customer and their QA or QC department can check it according to the uh, requirements. Is it possible or not? Sometimes a new crop or another variety can give another taste. And, uh, and when you have any doubt, please ask to test it. Okay, next slide, please. The second crucial factor, in my opinion, is price. So always look at price and the conditions. What is the risks and who is paying for the cost? And uh, in the uh, spice business, the most common way of uh, selling it is CFR European Main Port or CFI European Main Port, cost insurance freight or cost and freight European main port is the most common uh, <clears throat> inco term used, which means all the costs until the harbor, the main harbor in Europe are for the supplier from the country of origin. And also some other costs are often involved. And I talked about pre-shipment analysis, who is paying the cost for this? And they can be sampling, analyzing, etc. You can be looking at $1,000 or 1,000 euro more or less for one container load. So that's quite some cost involved. So it has to be clear, stated who is paying for what cost. And what also is important in my opinion, or what I would prefer to, to, to recommend is some transparency in the main cost driver. What is the raw material part in your total cost? What is the processing cost? And what is the transport cost? I think these are three main price drivers and when you have explained a little bit about this to your customer in Europe, it's also easy to explain price fluctuations and price increases, increases or decreases. Next slide, please. And that's immediately the hub to the next price, price uh, slide because it's all about market compliance. Your price should be in line with your competition. There are no European buyers who will pay an, uh, an extra only if they have a premium, but normally they would look if it's a replacement, they would look is your price competitive. And of course, price is related to quality. That's always very important to remember because in, in turmeric, uh, the main quality uh, requirement is uh, a volume is between two and a half and three percent curcumin in Europe. But there are also niche markets with higher turcumin contents of, of 4% or 5%. And of course, there is a different price. But price compliance is very important for European buyers. Otherwise, they will not shift to a new supplier. So last but uh, concerning price is also sharing market intelligence or sharing price information is a very important issue in the spice business to establish long-term cooperation i always told buyers or suppliers if you if you see changes in the market tell me in advance and be proactive uh, instead of uh, tell me afterwards that the price increased by 10 percent or 20 percent because then it can be too late to build a to build a win-win situation when you both are in time to react on market changes that's very important for success in the business next slide please like Luz told already turmeric is in many recipes and uh, i think that this is also why it's very important for uh, European buyers to have a supply chain which is reliable and flexible. Because there are some major hazards in crop failure and in shipping and in export restrictions. And when I look at crop, we all know about climate change. When the monsoon in India is one month late or when there is too much rain or floods or whatever, you know, the, the supply can be a big problem and can be delayed. Also shipping issues we have seen during the Corona issue, Corona period, that there was a lot of shipping issues, uh, products shipped too late, but also uh, a lack of containers and sea freights 
uh, jumped up in price. So uh, all these kinds of issues are very important to discuss with your uh, customer and to make sure that's very important because in Europe, nobody accepts that there is a product not in the shelf of a supermarket. The shelves in the supermarket should be always filled. There is no, uh, there should be no empty shelves. And otherwise somebody in the supply chain will get the bill for this. So my recommendation to EU buyers is dual sourcing. Risk mitigation is an important part of buying your turmeric. So don't look only at India and develop some business with other countries besides India and uh, maybe uh, put some volumes to Africa. And there are some countries like, like uh, Nigeria, like Madagascar, like Ethiopia, where maybe some uh, turmeric is available and uh, look at alternatives also to uh, develop this market as a supply source, which could be quite interesting in, in, uh, also for the future. And last but not least, keep some safety stock in Europe. Next slide, please. And then I come to the, the fourth critical success factor, in my opinion, is differentiation. Investigate in the market, investigate in the, in the EU market, what makes your turmeric special or how can you make your turmeric special? Yeah, and there are, I give here a few examples, but there are maybe other examples. First of all, sustainability. Corporate social responsibility is very important for uh, major European buyers these days, and they have uh, committed themselves in the Sustainable Spice Initiative to increase the sustainable sourcing of spices. So also for turmeric, when they would be looking for new suppliers, they will for sure demand sustainable uh, turmeric according to their uh, requirements instead of a new supplier who is not sustainable. So this is an opportunity. And besides sustainability, you can also look at organic, which is a nice niche, I think. In Europe, it's about five to 7% of the market, which is not the largest volume, but it's a quite attractive niche. And please make sure that you then comply with the European organic legislation. That's very important, otherwise your product in Europe uh, is not allowed to be called organic on the label. Adding value is also something which is happening more and more. Grinding, heat treatment, blending, a uh, special way of packaging that's happening more and more in countries of origin and can be a very nice uh, opportunities for new suppliers to look at the European market and, uh, and enter this market with a good product. And last but not least, uh, uh, the health food market, Luz mentioned it already. Uh, turmeric has many health benefits. And in particular, since the Corona period, there are a lot of new items which are uh, considered superfoods uh, or uh, have a, a very good health benefits. And that's a nice niche market. So I would say really uh, uh, visit the food exhibitions in Europe and uh, investigate what your opportunities are. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to give the floor to Raymond, who is going to explain a little bit more about uh, the uh, sourcing of turmeric and the strategy of turmeric sourcing of Euroma. Yes, thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, so, Luz, if you can go to the next slide. Um, first of all, it's a very short introduction. My name is Raymond Lantus. I'm purchasing manager at uh, Euroma responsible of uh, a team of purchasers who are dealing with herbs and spices, but as well uh, quality, uh, vendor quality management. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the processes and strategies uh, at Aroma. Um, a little bit uh, about the uh, quality uh, and approval process of uh, new items, new suppliers. So if you look at um, the approval process of a new supplier, as Paul already mentioned, what is very important is the technical data sheet where it all starts with, uh, including all the characteristics of the product, nutritional values, everything that needs to be in a technical data sheet to do a good assessment of uh, whether the product is uh, suitable for the applications where we use it for. 
Um, Aroma is a uh, very big processor of herbs and spices. Um, and what we do with the product is making end products for consumers. And we also have some industrial uh, customers, but um, the main part of the, of the product that we import ends up in, uh, in blends for end consumers. So it is very important um, that the product suits for the application. Um, of course, uh, samples for sensory assessment. We have a sensory panel at Aroma that is doing the assessment of uh, whether the product is available for the application in terms of taste and color and smell. Um, we work only with uh, GFSI certified um, uh, producers, uh, so that can either be the FSCC 22000, uh, BRC or, FS or IFS for instance. Um, and we do um, on-site uh, supplier audits. We have two lead auditors in our team uh, who can perform on-site uh, audits, uh, checking all the processes uh, which are done in the country of origin. Um, and also um, in case we uh, decide to buy product heat treated in country of origin, um, we also need to do a validation of the heat treatment. Uh, we have our own uh, steam sterilization uh, facility in the Netherlands, but sometimes uh, we buy um, or we consider to buy heat treated products. Um, what furthermore is very important is to do a mood, uh, to have a mutual agreement on a testing plan. So that is based on the risk analysis that Aroma is doing um, for the product based on one is the um, uh, alerts in the ROSF, so rapid alerts. And two is based on um, experience. So complaints that we have seen in the past, uh, the relevance of those complaints, the uh, the, the, the hazards, uh, and, and based on that, we have um, testing plans uh, which um, indicate on which parameters we do the analysis. Um, and then it all comes to a pre-shipment sampling procedure. So one of Paul's recommendations uh, as well. Uh, we perform uh, a pre-shipment sampling procedure. I will come back to that later on. So, Luz, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, more about the sourcing strategy of Aroma. Um, of course, we are looking at dual sourcing. And that can either be um, in different areas, growing areas in country of origin like India, but preferably um, multiple uh, countries of origin to source for turmeric. Um, we are definitely looking into other sources as well, other than India, although the market for turmeric is, of course, very big in India. Um, preferably, we work with suppliers that are uh, either way a member or familiar with um, the European Spice Association or ASTA. Um, and why is that? Um, the development of the regulations in Europe, uh, well, it, it's going very rapidly. You see that every year we have some new topics that are being regulated, um, uh, mainly on pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. Uh, we have seen that um, the development has uh, been rapidly and we have seen a lot of new regulations in the past years on, uh, on those um, pesticides mainly. So if suppliers are informed um, about uh, these developments, that helps us also. And if they are as well um, part of the discussion, uh, how to deal with it, how to cope with it, uh, and even have the discussions within ESA uh, to lobby about this, that will help us as well. Um, and that comes also to the next point, which is very important, is information. Uh, we believe that information is key. Um, we visit a lot of suppliers, and together with the suppliers, we also visit the fields to discuss together with suppliers and farmers about um, uh, the risks uh, that they see. But um, it is very important that we get the information. What does the supplier see um, uh, in terms of development? Not only how the crop is developing, but also what is going on in terms of use of, pes use of pesticides. So increasing, increasing the level of transparency, this is what we prefer to do together with long-term partnerships. Um, and um, as Paul already mentioned, um, sustainably certified products. Aroma is one of the four uh, co-founders of the SSI, the Sustainable Spice Initiative, and we are constantly looking to increase um, the volume that we import 
for sustainable products. And the aim of the SSI is to have a sustainable um, uh, supply chain as a standard. So um, nowadays you see that sustainable certified products are still trading at a premium. Um, also challenges nowadays that products, uh, mainly in food, are getting uh, more expensive. Um, but we would like to, uh, to work on this together with our suppliers to see how we can uh, have a mainstream of sustainable products in, the, in Europe. Um, yeah, next slide, Luz, please. Um, like I mentioned, we are working with um, a pre-shipment uh, sampling procedure, and I'm going to explain a little bit how we are doing this because it is not the, the most standard procedure as the most of, uh, of us know. Um, and first of all, explaining maybe um, best to explain the benefit of this. What we try to avoid is to get um, non-compliant material in the EU. So we um, do everything and our utmost to, um, to have EU compliant material entering uh, the port of destination uh, in Europe. Um, to do this, we work with a chain of custody uh, together with a third party. So in the case that we send a PO to one of our suppliers, um, there is a third party inspect inspector involved. Uh, who is getting the, um, uh, the, the notice of uh, taking samples uh, at our supplier. Um, he's doing this in an accredited me uh, method. Uh, he's also accredited to do this. Um, and once the samples are taken, um, the bags and the lot that is uh, designated uh, to send to Aroma is being sealed. Um, a sampling report is being sent to Aroma, and uh, where we can see uh, photos, where we have all the documentation, all the uh, numbers of the lot, so we know exactly which lot is being sampled, uh, how much sample um, products is uh, going to be sent, because those samples are sent to Europe. First to Aroma, Aroma does some assessment uh, on sensory uh, part, and then forward them to a European laboratory. And from that point, the analysis starts. So on, on, on all the parameters that we, um, uh, that we uh, have indicated to do the analysis, and once we have the results, um, the uh, third party, um, uh, they communicate the results, and either way it is being rejected or approved to the supplier, and then uh, the supplier can do the shipment. And then again, once, once the product is being loaded, uh, a third party inspector is being attending uh, um, the loading of the, uh, of the container to be sure that the right lot is being loaded for Aroma, uh, the sample lot. So this looks quite uh, true, but it is um, a very uh, a good, good way to be 100% sure that EU compliant material is entering our ports. Um, this avoids a lot of um, costs when products are being sent to Roma and we have to reject it here because then you need to send it back um, with, a long, with a long lead time, of course, and a lot of costs involved. So we really believe that this is the way to do it. Um, and we have already some, uh, some very good experience with this. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Luz, please. Thank you. So as I mentioned, we have a mutual agreed testing plan where it all starts with. So before we have the testing plan, we don't talk about business. This is the first thing that we need to set up together with the supplier. Um, this testing plan indicates on which parameters um, we will be testing as soon as we have received the samples at, uh, at Aroma and also at which uh, frequency uh, the tests will be done. So Aroma is performing monthly uh, risk analysis, and uh, like I said, based on the USF uh, rapid alerts, and based on experience in terms of complaints or uh, what we have seen in the past. Um, and such a testing plan indicates on all uh, kind of um, uh, pesticides, contaminations, on the testing method, um, how much uh, and, and, and the frequency uh, that we test. Um, and this, like I mentioned, is essential before we, um, before we start any business. Um, yeah, I think that is it for my part then. If you go to the next slide, Luz.
So, um, yeah, thanks a lot. I think uh, Thomas will take over from here. Yes, thank you, uh, Ramon. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Luz and Paul, of course. It was all very interesting. Uh, now we go to uh, the final part of uh, this webinar, which are the, the questions. Uh, we had a, a couple of questions, so I'll, I will go to the questions and uh, uh, I will read them out uh, for you and hope uh, we can answer the questions of, of our audience. Um, the first question we had was, uh, uh, what about adulteration and quality issues? And uh, let me extend this question a bit because I think it's also very interesting. Uh, I, I also read a lot about adulteration and I, I get the feeling that it's a, a bigger issue in, in turmeric than in other spices. So uh, is that true? And um, how to deal with this, both as an importer as, and as well as an exporter who maybe buys uh, from other growers? Uh, who can uh, answer this best? <laughs> I will. Uh, I will give it a try. Um, oh. Well, what we see is that um, we are testing a lot on, um, for instance, illegal dyes. Um, so um, uh, forbidden tolerance. Um, and yeah, there we have seen in the past some um, um, some illegal dyes that shouldn't be in there. Uh, so it's regulated by EU regulation, um, and, and it's, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, also a part of our testing plan that we um, test this with a uh, certain frequency that can either be each batch or a couple of times per year. Um, and besides that, we are performing um, on a selected um, range of products, we are performing DNA tests each year. Uh, so that... Um, you have uh, methods that can um, uh, indicate the DNA of the product, so you are 100% sure that it is exactly uh, the turmeric or the product, the spice that you um, that you expect to receive. Okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe in addition to that, Thomas, uh, and you mentioned turmeric has a high risk product concerning adulteration. That also has to do because I think in Europe, the, the major part of turmeric and maybe even up to 90% is imported as a grounded product. Mm -hmm. So grounded products in general are, are high risk products concerning uh, contamination compared to when you buy a whole spice. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe that's mm -hmm. also a good introduction for another question because we also have a question that was um, our turmeric requirements for fresh or ground turmeric. So are they different? Uh, did we talk today mostly about the ground turmeric and are the requirements for fresh turmeric different? Uh, yes, the requirements for, for uh, fresh turmeric, are maybe not on, on residues levels, but uh, in uh, the grounded turmeric or the dried turmeric is considered a spice. And often in the, uh, when you look at the fresh turmeric and also like fresh ginger, it's a total different market. It's more sold and imported by the, the yeah, let's say the fresh produce people instead of by the spice uh, people. So it's, it's uh, I don't know exactly the specifications, but in my opinion, the same rules account for uh, aflatoxin, ochlatoxin, and uh, and residues, uh, maximum residues levels. Indeed, but fresh market is is quite interesting for uh, suppliers from origin to look at as well, and not only at the grind market, because I think this fresh market. And we have all seen now fresh turmeric in the in the supermarkets, which, which wasn't there 10 years ago. So it's an interesting market also to look at because the same supplier could serve the spice market as well as the fresh market, in my opinion. Yes. I, I would like to add to that, that there are also for fresh turmeric, uh, a lot of opportunities for organic certified uh, fresh turmeric. If we take a look at the supermarkets, the, uh, you see the fresh turmeric very often in uh, supermarket chains that are dedicated to organic produce, or you see it in like high-end supermarkets in the organic yeah. uh, variant. So I would say mostly uh, it's, it's uh, for organic. 
Okay, thank you. And and uh, yeah, together with this question, you had like a second question. Uh, what's the current uh, free on board price per ton? Or or and maybe or are there any sources where you can find uh, actual prices on 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 free on board prices per ton for ground determined? Let's say that right. Yeah, it's a good question, but that's that's indeed a difficult one. I mean, I would uh, recommend uh, new suppliers to the European market always to to investigate this together with the, the potential customer, because every quality has his price and every uh, specification has his price. So it's very difficult to talk about a general price, but uh, as some companies like in my presentation I used a graph of NetSpice that's a company who is uh, on their website uh, explaining some price information which could be used and also the uh, Indian um, spices board is uh, informing some price information but it yeah it's always pricing from in the past if you if you want to know exactly the current price situation then uh, ask your buyer which price is competitive and often you will uh, we will get a price but you always have to consider exactly what's in there what costs are in there what quality is it are we talking about because uh, i can tell you uh, for instance a uh, uh, curcuma with a very high uh, curcumin content is a totally different price than uh, curcuma with a lower uh, curcumin content it can be double Price can be double when you talk about the curcumin content about 5% or 6%, which is a niche product, but which has a total different pricing. Okay. Yeah, we, we actually we have another question about that. The question is: uh, Do you differentiate in price for 2.5% versus 3% curcumin? I think the main volu volumes of uh, of turmeric are in between 2.5 and 3% on uh, curcumin uh, content. Um, what we do see is that there is not uh, necessarily a bigger demand for a higher uh, content of curcumin. So it is not like um, uh, uh, important to increase uh, the volumes of a higher content because it's also, like Paul mentioned, there is a, a, a very big price uh, difference. Um, and the applications where at least where we are using it for, it's not necessarily um, needed to have a higher content. So um, I think between two and a half point and, and, and three, it's uh, it's the mainstream. Uh, and in between, uh, yeah, of course, you need to uh, to fix the specification, and, and then from that point, you can you can talk about um, about prices. But uh, but big differentiation in between there there isn't no. Okay, thank you. Um, so then we have a, a question uh, here. Um, how much would you estimate the additional cost for producers of, of exporting uh, to the European Union compared to a home or regional market? So what, what, what extra costs are there for the producer or exporter to export to Europe compared to regional markets? Oh, poor, very good question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a difficult absolutely. answer. Yeah, because like like I explained, the, the the you should talk already to your growers not to use certain pesticides, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, when you want to export to the European market, so it's really a long term planning and with agronomists in place. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's it's very difficult to serve the European market. What I always did uh, explain to my uh, suppliers in the past was don't serve only only the European market. Yeah, look also to other markets because there can be uh, reasons why your product is not suitable for the European market, but very well suitable for another market. So I would say focus not only on the European market, but try to serve other markets as well. 
Uh, but but the, the extra cost would be mainly in in, in getting uh, certain uh, certifications like uh, uh, Global Gap or HACP or so that that's um, probably the yeah, main, of course, main extra cost. Certification is the cert certifying is costing money, but it's also uh, preventing you from all kinds of problems which are costing money. So it, that, that's very important to know. But the additional cost is very difficult, you know, because sometimes uh, farmers, let's say in a, in a certain country, are growing already turmeric uh, organic, but it's not organic certified yet. Mm -hmm. Then the additional cost is only the certification and nothing else. So, but really? when you have to really change your total uh, system, then the, uh, then the cost can be very high to serve the, uh, the European market. Depends on the situation. It's very difficult to give the one answer on this question, I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe to maybe add on that. Add yeah. Something or look something yeah, yeah, well, maybe to add on that, it is not necessarily needed to have like a certification as, as global gap or, or, or organic and to have a material that is EU compliant. What we have also seen in the past and during traveling also in, uh, in, in, in India, for instance, and you have these uh, these programs called IPMs, Integrated Pesticide Management Programs, with farmers and uh, with growers. That um, is all about education. So making sure that farmers know exactly what they can and what they cannot do uh, on their fields um, in order to have a material that is EU compliant. So their information uh, comes around again is very important and is key. And is also the reason why we uh, travel quite a lot to countries of origin. To not to to um, uh, tell everyone how it should be done, but to understand um, and to discuss with our uh, suppliers and, and with the farmers about the best uh, practices that can be done and, and the, where we uh, need to put our effort in um, to make sure that the product is EU compliant. And we are uh, very much aware that this takes a lot of effort. And we are also very uh, much aware of the fact that the domestic market can be a lot, lot bigger than uh, the export market uh, to EU. So that is always the challenge. Um, but of course, there is a price difference uh, in between uh, the product that a supplier can export to, to EU, which is compliant, uh, and the, the price that he gets um, for the product that is not EU compliant, but when he sells it to the domestic market. So I think there is, um, there is um, for sure, there's an incentive uh, to have an EU compliant material. Um, it's hard to say uh, uh, the exact amount of that incentive, but uh, there is definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, so and then the next question, is, it's kind of a broad question, but maybe uh, you can uh, give some, uh, some starting tips. Uh, the question is from a, a, a turmeric producer and supplier from Tanzania. And um, he's asking, um, um, how can you get a, a market in, to, to Europe, in Europe? Kindly enlighten me. So how, what would be his first steps to, to successfully enter the European market? Can you give some first tips for him, please? Well, I think it starts with, with having a market uh, at, at its own. So um, I would not start um, focus, being focusing only on the EU market. And there should be already a domestic market before you start uh, looking at EU uh, exports. Uh, I think this is more or less in line with what Paul said. Don't uh, bet on EU only and not having any other output. So if you um, have done this for a couple of years, having a domestic market and a good, a, 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 well, a good business, then I think it will start with um, sharing information about what you are doing uh, and in what way you think you can uh, comply with EU regulation. Or if you have, have questions about this, look for local authorities to, to gain some information uh, look for importers and to to and to know and to understand what are the needs and the requirements from importers in the EU. And I think that would be a starting point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Thomas. In addition to that, I would say uh, read the uh, CBI uh, reports, and uh, yeah. uh, there is a lot of information available there. 
and visits the food exhibitions. I think also food mm -hmm. exhibitions are a good source to start in gathering uh, information about possibilities, opportunities. Yeah, I mostly agree. That just uh, just uh, uh, as Paul said on our website, we have uh, we have market studies about uh, about exporting turmeric to Europe, both a study on market potential as well as a study on market entry, uh, where also the bio requirements are discussed. And we have a separate study for spices in general on bio requirements, where all uh, good tips are there, including some some uh, where to find more information on, on technical data sheets and certificate of analysis and that kind of uh, things. So please visit our website for that. I would like to also uh, make an addition to this yes. um, and to what Bremen and Paul were saying about not necessarily starting with the focus of the European Union or of Europe, because uh, you also need a certain volume to be able to serve the European market. So it is good that uh, companies start maybe with the local or with regional market, cr having you know, creating uh, this uh, volumes, creating a routine, then after you have that, you can start checking uh, how compliant your product currently is to the European standards, and then yeah. starting to see what mm -hmm. you can adapt from that. And also, if we go back to the four critical points that Paul was presenting, at the end, we had the differentiation. So I think if you are going to reach a company, for example, in a trade show, it would be really good if you could say something on that. If you could say that you have a certain volume that is relevant, that your material is compliant to EU regulation, and that you also have an added value that could uh, you know make you interesting in the in the sea of uh, suppliers that might be reaching out uh, to new customers so i think uh, this is how i would do it okay thank you yeah. uh, so let's go to the next question uh, there's a question uh, how is the demand and supply equation now uh, he's saying still a certain demand is not met question mark is, is it true is there more demand than supply um yeah i think when it comes to demand um in eu compliant material um yeah there is still a, a lot of demand um and i think the the supply can can well not met this in full uh, at this moment okay thank you so yeah there's definitely um there's definitely a potential in the market if you look at it in that perspective oh. so um eu compliant material is, is um uh, always challenging uh, to get enough uh, uh enough supply and the demand is well like uh, like Luz, uh gave a, 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 some very good examples uh why the uh, the demand is still increasing and we don't expect this to um, to uh, to disappear at all. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see. We have some more question, and then we are all almost almost out of time. Um, I have this question here, um, and I'm going to read it out. Uh, currently. If a container imported to Europe does not meet legal requirements, for example, for example uh, because of uh, aflatoxin, the container can be sent back to the country of origin. Uh, are you aware of the discussions ongoing about such border rejections, enforcing destruction of the container content and not giving the alternative of sending it back? Yeah, well, I uh, I would like yeah. to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> um, I also know about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, to be honest, um, a couple of years ago we have seen this. Uh, we have also faced this that a container that um, entered the EU port or entered the Roma did not met um, the regulations, um, so not EU compliant and could be sent back. Yes, indeed. But if you look at um, two points you have a price of transport which you need to pay double because you are importing it and you need to re-export it uh, and the second and uh, quite important one is that we are uh, without any material 
Um, and that is for our business, um, uh, yeah, th th this is uh, terrible, let's say, um, uh, because we expect that container, we expected that we could produce according to a production plan, but we don't have the container at that moment. So this is exactly the reason why we have implemented um, um, a pre-shipment uh, sampling procedure to avoid that product enters the EU that is not EU compliant. Um, I think this is this is crucial to do because you cannot um, guess on whether a container will be EU compliant or not when it arrives. Uh, from India, products uh, will be on the water for for six to seven weeks. Um, it, it's quite a long lead time to have it in house. Uh, so yeah, exactly the reason why we implemented this procedure. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question, and it's probably about financing the supply. Is it, the question is, is it suitable for European importers to make a down payment first uh, to their new supplier in other countries? I don't well, think it's very suitable. Eh? No. No, no, at least not the way we work with it. No. So yeah, there's not the way you, uh, it usually works for most imports. No, if you if you're not, I mean, uh, turmeric in general is a low cost spice. So if you know if you're not able to finance a container load, and it can be a 20 footer or a 40 footer, but th that tells something about the the situation. I think. No, I don't think that's common. That there will be. A, in the past, there were there was used a letter of credit, but I think even that is old fashioned these days. So it's, uh, it's it, the, the supplier should be able to finance the container until the main port of Europe, and then payments can be arranged. And in particularly the first container, I think, a new a new uh, or a buyer will pay a new supplier quite soon after he receives and has approved the product. So yeah. that can be negotiated. The payment term and that can be 30 days instead of 90 days, maybe, which is. Uh, uh, more common, but uh, no prepayment. I don't think so. Okay, that's a, that's a clear answer. Thank you. Uh, so maybe I'll go to the last question. Uh, actually, that will be my question because also I was listening to your story, Paul, uh, about minimum residue levels, and I was just wondering where uh, producers uh, can find the the information about what what the minimum residue levels for the different um, uh, has for the different spices and for the different uh, uh, contents are. Yeah, maybe I said minimum residue levels, but I mean maximum residue levels. Of oh, course. Of course. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> no, of, uh, I, I do not know exactly the link, to be honest, where to find this in the European food law. But all major, uh, I would recommend uh, to contact all major laboratories, uh, and like Eurofins, SDS, etc. They know exactly. They even have a, a package which they offer uh, to you uh, to make sure they test your turmeric according to the European food legislation maximum residues level, and they know exactly. And they, they, these laboratories, I must say, they follow also the new developments quite good because that is their their business. And I can tell you they have a good business. So they do a lot of testing and they know exactly how to do it. So, uh, but okay, there is um, a, a way to find it somewhere on, on the internet for sure in the European food law where these levels are, but I don't have the link. Beyond. Maybe yeah. it's in one of the CBI reports. I don't know, Luz, do you know? Yeah, I think yes. so. Uh, Luz, yes. can, you, can you confirm <laughs> yeah, in that? In the CBI, in the specific study for curcuma, and I believe probably also in the general uh, study of spices and herbs, you might have a link uh, yeah. where you can access. And it's like a database. The European Union has a database where you can type the product, and then you will you're able to download a an Excel table where you can get exactly uh, the substance and what would be the maximum uh, level, the maximum residue level. I can also afterwards share the link if if that's if you would like to. 
I just don't have it at the moment. <laughs> no, no, it's it's a it's a good thing. We can uh, we can uh, uh, we will uh, share the link in the follow up mail, which will uh, follow a few days after this uh, webinar. So this is will be the the closing of this webinar. Uh, as I thought, you will you will all receive a follow up mail with uh, the with the presentations uh, and with the link to the to that source uh, Luz just mentioned and also to a recording of this webinar so you can re-watch it if you want or send it to your colleagues or other interested people. Uh, so that's, then we will close this webinar. I will like to thank all speakers, uh, Ramon, Luz, uh, Paul, thank you very much uh, for your input today. It was very interesting and I hope it was interesting for the audience as well. And um, thank you all. And thank you audience for being here. Hope to see you in our next uh, webinars. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.